Okay, folks, you're very welcome to DSS coaching series here in conjunction with the Locker Room podcast series. Uh, tonight, I am delighted to be joined by the one and only Declan Quill. Declan is the Curry Senior Ladies All-Ireland winning manager, part manager, joint manager, may I say. So I'll get straight into it. Declan, pleasure to have you. But one question I would ask is, who is Declan Quill? Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, who is Declan Quill? That's a great question. I tried to figure that out myself over the last few years. But uh, I suppose currently, like you said, um, co-manager of the Kerry Ladies Senior Football Team. Um, delighted to be, I suppose, now recognised as an All-Ireland winning manager, which is fa- fabulous thing to be able to, to say. Um, former Kerry footballer, played uh, with Kerry between 2001 and 2008, winning two All-Ireland medals myself. And... I suppose former Kearns or Ahleys footballer um, as well here in Tralee, played senior football for my club for about 20 years or so, um, winning a county championship medal in 2002. Um, I suppose outside of sport, um, married to Erica and have three boys, Adam, Matty and Tommy. So hands are full uh, on the football field and off the football field. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, I suppose we'll get into it, Declan. Um, there, there's plenty to talk about. Uh, for uh, if we go right back, I suppose to when you when you were were a young young man growing up in Kerry, what enticed you into GA? Um, I suppose I suppose the main influence would have, would have been my father. I suppose on on um on me uh, bringing me down to the field when I was very very young. I suppose um he was a master. He never played himself, but his father would have won all Ireland medals with Kerry back in the in the thirties. Uh, my dad wouldn't have played himself, but uh, being a local teacher here in the local school, he would have trained nearly every single young fella around Tralee at one stage, you know, and um, he was a massive administrator for our club, um, coaching the juvenile level at, you know, under eights and under tens, uh, as we had at the time. And I suppose he brought me everywhere with him, you know, when he was training the under 14 and 16s in the club, uh, I would have been there at all the training sessions and, um you know, they had a lot of trips away and things like that. And I was always on the bus with them. And um, I suppose that's where the, the love of the GA, I suppose, came for me. It was definitely driven uh, by my father. And, um, you know, I remember, you know, being down in the field as young as four years of age. I have a, a trophy here at home from a blitz we played in 1986 when I was four. And I still have that trophy. So uh, it was a lovely <laughs> thing to have, you know, um, bringing me to All-Ireland Finals when I was just three years of age, you know, in 1985, All-Ireland Final. Um, meeting an icon like John Dowling on the way to, to Crow Park, who was the 1955 Kerry captain and a member of my own club. Um, you know, and I suppose just grew up with it, uh, playing in Holy Family National School, um, where my dad was a teacher, uh, playing in Coming to Munskull, which, which I would be very much involved in as a teacher myself um, the last number of years uh, since I began teaching in Tralee. And, you know, playing underage with your club and just enjoying it and uh, playing with the friends and, just going down to training on Saturday mornings uh, for an hour when you were, when we were younger and then just taking it from there out of the academy into under 12s, 14s. And I suppose it got very successful as we were getting older with, um, with I suppose, m- making Kerry North teams under 14, under 16. But, you know, really enjoying school football with Tralee CBS and winning two Kearney Varees with them and kind of just getting more successful with the club as we got older. Um, but, you know, I suppose... The very very starting point is like every other child i suppose you, the parent is the one to bring them down to the field the very first time and uh you know it's a huge part of my life it's something that I, i'm delighted i was i was introduced and delighted to be involved at the ga and you know branched out to the ljfa in the last couple of years and um you know it's been just been a, a fantastic uh, part of my life for the last number of years and i suppose obviously he would have played coming one school and he would have went then on to secondary school post primary school and then that would have been where your development squads would have came into play was it always i suppose a, a desire to try and get to would you be that type of person that try and reach the the maximum pinnacle of, of what you do in terms of trying to get to senior kind of football because obviously I, I would i would feel that nearly every child now that's in Kerry wants to play at the highest level and try and be a day, the next David Clifford. But obviously he wasn't there at the time. <laughs> he he, yeah. he was after you. But was that something that was there for you? Well, I suppose look, when you're when you're living in Kerry, there's always going to be heroes, I suppose, in, in the Kerry senior team. Like um, we're absolutely spoiled at the moment with the likes of David Clifford and, and Shawnee O'Shea and 
Tyg Morley and, 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 you know, we'd all want to be forwards, I suppose, but you look at the back towards Jason Foley and Shane Ryan, all very, very good footballers and, and massive role models for our young lads that are growing up. But, you know, I suppose when I was growing up, Kerry weren't so successful after 1986. Things dried up a big big time till, till 1997, you know. But um, I've met, I have great memories of, of Kerry training in our own club field down in Kearns Rahalis under uh, Ogie Moore and Stuart Strip and... Uh, I used to be down behind the goals, collecting balls for the lads. And, you know, at that time, this was Morris Fitzgerald was breaking onto the scene. And uh, I, I, I suppose my favourite players at the time was my own club man, Morgan Nix. And he was, he was a neighbour of mine, just lived straight across the road from me. And I uh, just used to go down and watch them train. And I was only very young at the time. Like, and when I think back in it, like, something you probably wouldn't let your young fella do in a school night. Like, no, you know, 10, 11 years of age, down behind the, the goals, collecting footballs for the Kerry team and walking away up home afterwards. Um, I always remember... Ogie tried to get Bomber Liston back into shape and Bomber used to be very back of all the runs, you know, and this is a man with seven, or six or seven All-Ireland medals at the time and Ogie had to persuade him just to come back out of retirement and give it one more go and um, just remember looking at them and going, geez, like, it's it's phenomenal to see these guys training and um, I suppose as I was growing up, I, it was something I always wanted to do. I always wanted to play with Kerry, you know, it, it was, I never hid from that fact and I always tried to push myself, train, uh, do extra bit of work, you know, I suppose there was no real gym work or anything like that at the time, you know, it's so, totally changed now, but I'd always be down the field kicking and uh, taking frees and, and, and things like that. And I thought, you know, as I, as I was growing up and I was making Kerry North under 16 teams and uh, competing with, with the other counties around Munster, um, it was nice to get that kind of validation that you were on the right path. And, um, you know, I made two years of Kerry minor in 99 and 2000 and, you know, from from then on, it, it was um, it was a dream just to come true, and I suppose break into the Kerry senior team eventually. And it, it was um, it was a nice thing to be able to do, you know. And I suppose we well, you, you finished up then with with Kerry senior with Kerry senior football team, and I'm assuming you you went back to Kieran O'Rahillys for another couple of years. Was there anything I suppose you would have taken away from being at that elite level? I suppose at the time you were under. Really good, I suppose, coaches and managers within within the Kerry senior team, but also you would have had uh, really good people around the dressing room. That was when Kerry were going well. Was there anything that you would have, I suppose, taken back for yourself back into your club when you were playing, but also maybe you've still kept with you uh, now that you've transitioned into coach and managing and so on? Yeah, look, I suppose, I suppose the one thing that I probably took from my career with Kerry was, you know, that every single person is is, is vital to the success of, of the team, you know, and I suppose my career would have coincided with the great Colin Cooper's career. And unfortunately, we were we were playing in the same position, you know, and um, <laughs> there was only going to be one winner there, whereas, um, you know, an absolute fantastic footballer. Um, the one thing I would say my my position was right corner forward, and that was really the only position I could play. Um Whereas nowadays, a lot of fellas seem to be able to be, you know, flexible where they can go on that. But right corner forward is where I played in my club. I played full forward every now and again. But right corner forward is my position. And when you're when you're competing with the Gooch, you know, one of the all-time greats, yeah. it was hard to get on the team during championship. Whereas I would have played an awful lot of league games and, you know, I would have trained as hard as everybody else and everything like that. But, you know, I suppose it showed that, you know, without the likes of myself training and, and pushing the others so hard, you know, that maybe the Gooch wouldn't have been as good and maybe Kerry wouldn't have been as successful or maybe like Tom O'Sullivan, who I often marked, or Mike McCarthy, who I often marked in training, may, may not have been as good, only for that they were marking me and, and other guys that weren't making the team but were, were very strong on the panel, you know. Um, it was something I probably took into coaching uh, with me that, and it's it's thing I, I just dread doing is, you know, I, I get the job of calling out the team uh, before games and it's something I always just, panic with because I know the first 15 are going to be absolutely delighted and then you have 16 to 30 that are going to be really upset there's going to be four three or four girls that are going to be really really upset like we had for the All-Ireland final this year you know very hard to leave the likes of Lorraine Scanlon and done half the team and then you go further into the pan you're leaving six girls let's say out of the out of the 30 altogether you know but um I just thought you know from my own career being that sub uh something I have a lot of empathy for those those players and um you know, we try to talk to them and try to include them as much as we would would talk to the first fifteen and and make them feel as important as the first fifteen. And 
even you know the six girls who didn't make the the 30 this year you know we'd, we would have togged them all out which was probably against the rules of the lgfa and we brought them all out onto the field and we got them into the squad photo uh before the all Ireland final and everything like that and they they didn't wear our moyer on, on the sideline but i just think that you know i thought it was a really important thing that the whole you're never going to win anything with 15 players and 15 players going well it's it's the 30 and it's a really hard position to be in you know i remember times when i was you know just really down about the whole thing being inside with Kerry and being on the b team all the time and um i think i learned an awful lot from that just having the empathy and maybe just yeah. realizing that the girls who are not playing are are contributing so much outside of the starting the starting positions and um you know i think when you see that from from your own point of view from your own career then it's it's really easy to see it maybe from a girl's point of view who's maybe down round number 24 and she comes to you and asks you well why am i playing or why am i getting minutes you know some coach could just shrug it off and say look just get on with it but you know myself and dara raw was great to talk to the girls and kind of give them from our perspective and give them the time of day and maybe give them a few pointers that could get them on the team eventually you know yeah when when did you hang up the boots, Declan, or, or are you still playing a bit? <laughs> no, <laughs> um, I suppose. Look, I suppose I started with Kerry straight out of minor. I went in with. Um, I suppose I played my first league game when the national league was 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 still being played before Christmas. Kerry won the All Ireland in two thousand, and there was a few league games before Christmas. And I suppose a lot of the lads were still on the beer before Christmas, and they drafted in a few of us. Uh, went up to Tyrone to play a league game. I'll never forget my first league game above in Tyrone and. Jeannie Mac was on in Dungan and it was they were just baying for blood at that, that you know, they were just uh ferocious oh geez, it was like a cauldron. I, I remember coming on in the second half and Paddy O'Shea looking at me, he says, You'll do grand, you'll do grand. And I was looking around going, Oh my god, what am I letting myself in for here? But uh, I, I suppose it wasn't until uh later on in the summer of two thousand and one when I when I kind of was ready to come in. I went in for a few trial games and did really, really well and Paddy brought me into the panel. I suppose that year we were hammered by Mead in in an All Ireland semi final. I had the distinction of scoring Kerry's only score in the second half. I think we scored five points that day against Mead. We got actually hockeyed out the, off the off the field, you know, and it was disappointing uh, into my first year. But um, I suppose it, losing an All Ireland to Armand and being beaten by Tyrone the following year. But we finally got there in two thousand and four, and I was part of the panel in two thousand and seven as well. But um, two thousand eight, early two thousand eight. The first couple of league games, I was involved with Pat O'Shea, and I the whole it, the whole thing was very mentally very very tough. Like you know, it it's very hard to be playing league games and then not playing championship games and being a sub for, you know, the championship. Um, I was coming on all right, and it, I probably would have played in six. I think it was six All Ireland semi finals. I would have featured in, you know, but it's very hard to put an awful lot of that effort or your life on hold for an awful lot, and then maybe getting a couple of minutes here and there. And I, like I said, two minute a few minutes ago, that's where I'd have the empathy for the girls that weren't making yeah. our panels or weren't making our team this year. And, you know, it is really, really hard to keep going and kind of be positive all the time. And, um, you know, you nearly know the team before it's even read out. And I suppose I was very young in 2008 when I, when I hung up the boots at Kerry, I was only 26, like, you know, and I was a couple of years, maybe top scorer in the league in division one. And, you know, I really, I did enjoy my time there. I trained under Paddy O'Shea. I trained under Jack O'Connor and I trained under Pat, Pat O'Shea three all-time legends of, of Kerry coaching, you know, and I took an awful lot from what they did with the, with the teams uh, into my coaching since I started, you know. Um, but I suppose, look, I went back to the club, really enjoyed the club uh, football. Like, when, when, I, when I went back, actually, Jack, Jack O'Connor was had taken over our team. Uh, his nephew, uh, Jono, would have been one of our players, one of our main players, and Jack uh, decided to take over the team and got us to a county final, which was epic we were we beat south kerry which were a brilliant team after a semi-final after a replay and we lost the county final after a replay to an absolutely fantastic mid kerry team in a last second penalty we were a very dubious decision against us and i was captain that year and I, it was something i'd love to have done captain the club to win a county championship but um i stayed on for another you know i suppose i retired kind of fully at 33 my body was kind of breaking down I, awful problems with my calves towards the end I was pulling one calf and that was coming back and then I was pulling the other calf and you know, I ended up playing on the C team in my last year and it was brilliant. We played in a competition called the Molyneux Cup and played with legends like Barry O'Shea and Morgan O'Shea who would have won all Ireland medals in 1997 and the, you know um, we got to the Molyneux Cup final and I pulled my hamstring and 
I came on, put the boots into the bin and said, that's it for me. No, I'm, I'm done. And people were looking at me, go, you're only 33, 34. There's loads more left in you. And I was like, not a hope. You're pulling your hamstring in a C match. Uh, it's time. <laughs> to get up, you know? uh, so I focused myself towards, um, towards the coaching side of it then after that. Yeah, and, yeah, and that, that was my next question for you. What led you down the pathway to coaching or where did that all come from? Um, being being in a, a GA dressing room is addictive. Like, you know, she's even walking in and I haven't really been involved with my own club in this from, I suppose, I'm involved with the under nines, under 11s, that, that kind of academy age. But even when I walk into the, the main senior dressing room now, kind of just as a visitor and early, like at this stage, kind of going in, it's like, it just gives me goosebumps looking at where I used to sit for nearly 20 years and when they get the, the smell of deep heat in the dressing room, you're like, <laughs> oh, Jesus, I'd love to be back at this again. But like, I was never going to, I thought to transition from playing to fill a gap would have been just to go coaching. So what I did straight yeah. away was I put my hand up for the minor job in the club and I started coaching our minors um, for two or three years, which was a lovely transition from being, a full-time player like like I would always give it a hundred percent first to training nearly last to leave like and I said well how am I going to fill that void in my life now and to be fair I went straight into coaching with our minor team and you know I think from there I've never not been involved in, in a team in some capacity you know um was it hard to, I suppose was it was it hard to transition from being being told what to do that to now you're actually telling Turkey lads, this is what we're doing, this is how we're doing it, or vice versa, girls. Like, was it a hard transition from the player to the coach? Um, oh, oh, people often ask me, like, do you miss it, or did did you, you know, did you miss playing? And I never, I, I never did, you know, like I said, you would walk into the dressing room now and again, you said, geez, I'd love to be back at this, but. When I gave it up, I knew it was time to to pack it in. Like I, I definitely had enough of it. I, I, I suppose put my life in hold for for long enough with with, with football, the commitment that it, it had taken, you know. And and the injuries then started to pile up, and I I knew my time was up. Like and I had no real problem from transitioning from that into coaching. Um, I suppose the young lads that I was coaching, the minors, um, would probably would have looked up to me a small bit. I suppose for being playing with the club for so long and. And uh, I, I could feel that respect from them in the dressing room and what we were doing on the training field and things like that. But, you know, when you come from from playing straight into coaching, you're very, very green. Like, you know, when I think back on some of the things even I did with that minor team, I, you'd be cringing going, geez, did that really happen? Or did I say that to that young fella? And I know it's a different different environment and a totally different environment nowadays. You know, there's stuff said to us in the dressing room there years ago that you couldn't open your mouth to anybody nowadays like you know you can't actually say anything negative at all nearly inside the dressing room no you'll be hauled over yeah. the coals but um no i i found the transition great i found that bridge uh just from playing going straight into coaching was a great way to just to stay involved in the game and maybe impart a little bit of knowledge and a bit of expertise onto the younger lads in in, in the club and um you know i suppose went from there nearly straight into the carry to carry ladies job then which has been fantastic over the last six years you know yeah, and that that was my that was my next question for you. So I I'm hoping my facts are right here. You became the joint manager with Dara of the Kerry Senior Ladies in 2020. What what led you to that point, or how did that even come about? Yeah, look, it was out of the, an out of the blue kind of phone call from Dara. You know, look, I suppose if anyone doesn't know the history between myself and Dara, we both play for opposite clubs in Tralee. You know, it's just like playing for Celtic and Rangers. Um, we would have, <laughs> yeah. I'm telling you, it was, it was that bad when we were growing up. You know, we would, we had two very, very good teams growing up. We met in a lot of finals on the way. They got the better of us, and some we got better of them. And uh, when we reached senior level, you know, anytime the teams played, it was fierce, crowded. There was always a niggle in the game. Myself and Dara wouldn't have been very friendly or anything like that. And you know, um, we would have just have known each other. And he went to a different school than I did in secondary school. Uh, uh, he went to the Great Colossia, and I went to. Tralee CBS so this phone number appeared on my my phone one day and I was like who is that like and I just decided to answer it anyway and he said look what just hear me out about this now and then I was like what's what's wrong with this fella like uh so I said <laughs> look I'm after getting the Kerry Minor ladies job and I was racking my brains thinking about who I would help get to help me 
and he said, look, your name was the first name to pop into my head. And I was like, how was, how was this? I was, I'm surely I was 10th or 11th on your list, like, you know, well done. And, and um, I suppose I was, I had maybe two or three years do, or two years, I'd say done with the minors in the club at that stage. And, uh, you know, I, he said, look, the Kerry minor job, it'll probably be about six months. He said, you know, it'll cork are very strong. If we're beaten in the Munster final, we'll be out and that's the end of it. There's no back door until it will be six, six months and yeah. we'll be finished with it, you know? And I said, you know, look, I'm not doing anything at the moment. I'll talk to the wife. She's inside in the kitchen. I'll ring you back in a while. I think about it. Uh, so I did that and I rang her back. I said, look, we give it a go anyway. And I knew very, very little about ladies football. I did take my, I had my, our own senior ladies in the club for a couple of years. All right. But that was club level, you know? Yeah. Um, Really enjoyed that, you know. I thought that was it was great crack and everything. But um, we got in stuck into the minors. Um, we were beaten in that monster final by Cork, but we gave them a, a hell of a six or eight, seven months that we had with them. It was so enjoyable. Uh, the girls came to us after the monster final. That's good. They keep training. That they enjoyed the year so much. We were like, the year is over, girls. You know, there's there's nothing we can do. Like, and they they enjoyed myself and Dara's. Um, I suppose our outlook towards football and our commitment to them and. Um, I suppose things. I suppose the message went out that the girls were really, really happy, and things were really good in the Kerry Minor setup. And Sean Walsh was the the count the the LGFA chairman at the time. Of course, Sean spent many years as the Munster Council chairman and the Kerry GA chairman, and a man with mass. I've massive respect for would have been chairman when I was playing with Kerry. And um, he rang myself and Darren just said, "Look, things aren't so great, and with the seniors at the moment." And we could see that we actually played the seniors in a, in a challenge match during our time with the minors. And, you know, we could see things weren't really going that well. And, you know, I'm not down on the management that I was there at the time or anything like that. But look, they yeah. were, we were just asked to go over and help one night. And I rang down. I was like, Jesus, do we really need this? Like, do we need, really need to be getting involved in this? Like trying to pick up after somebody else's mess. And he said, look, we'll just go over and have a look. And look, we'll, we'll see what it's like anyway. And, we went over and we had a look and things were like, oh, Jesus, this isn't, this isn't great. Like, you know, and I suppose within 15 minutes, I was going walking out the gate and Dara just says, no, just hang on, hang on, hang on. And I just, I spent another five minutes. I said, look, we're either have to get involved here now or we're going to walk away one or the other. So we just got involved in the session. We changed up a small bit what they were doing. We upped the intensity. We did about 45 minutes of what I suppose what we had with them and uh they were absolutely flat after it and this was after going through a league and the monster campaign and I was like their fitness levels are just terrible like you know and whatever else like but um they asked us to stay on and just give them a hand and like at that time you had about six weeks between the league finishing and championship starting so you didn't have the split season so I suppose nowadays you really only have a couple of weeks but yeah we had six weeks we brought Cassandra Buckley our SNC coach in with us and um, you know, we gave it a right shot, to be fair. Um, we were 10 points up in our first championship game against Galway. I think we shocked the life out of them. And uh, mm-hmm. I think they had the Leonards on the bench and they picked kind of a, a weak team to talk. Kerry were, were, were going to just roll over and they come to play us. And we were 10 points up at one stage and Galway had to tug out the Leonards and uh, get them on the field. And they eventually came back and beat us. We ran out of steam, uh, I suppose. And the next game was against Westmead in, in Killarney, a game we had to win. And we did, it was, it was great, you know, to get over the line. And then we played yeah. Dublin in the quarter final that year above in Tullamore and they just blew us off the field. We stayed with them for a while, but, you know, you could see their yeah. conditioning, their strength, their fitness, their football uh, under McBohan. And they were just phenomenal. Like, And I suppose it was a lovely taster to get in. We were probably there for a couple of months. We could see the standard. And uh, I suppose from there, we got massive feedback from the players. You know, they, they really wanted myself and Dara to be involved. And I suppose, look, we had a decision to make to stay on with the minors because we had a very good minor team coming through. A minor team that could possibly win an All Ireland, like Shif Roche, Danielle O'Leary, Mary O'Connell, just to name a few, like we're on that, we're going to be on that minor team, or to take maybe go in as selectors with the, the senior team. So, what we decided to do was we just said, look, if we're going in with the senior team, we're going in as the head men and that was it we're not going to be answered to anybody if we're going to be putting time and effort in, we're going in as as the top guys you know and yeah. that's what we went in as we said look we're coming in as top guys or nothing um i suppose fortunately in a way the minor competition only went as far as the monster and then covid wiped it out so 
we won't be looking back and going, geez, we missed out maybe in an All-Ireland minor <laughs> championship with them girls. But um, taking the senior job was was definitely the right, I, was definitely the right, I suppose, path for myself and Dara. And um, I suppose we haven't looked back. We've just tried to raise the standards every year. And I suppose the last three years we were, we were very been very very successful coming up from Division Two, winning Division One, and then I suppose getting the three All Ireland finals in a row and eventually winning one was was just fantastic. And I suppose it validated the the decision we made five yeah. years ago to get to go hell for leather with the senior job, you know. And and that 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 was where my next question was following to after reaching the pinnacle, I suppose this year of winning that All Ireland title after two All Ireland defeats. How did it feel? As as management and as I suppose a group, because you put so much time and effort, and it's kind of it's nearly like it's a whole buy-in. Like was it just euphoria, or I suppose it was just absolute. We were just ecstatic, you know. I just think the weight of the two years before just was just lifted off the shoulders. Like you know, it was going into the game. We were very very relaxed. We were we took an awful lot of the emotion that we had the last two years out of the whole thing. We just treat it as another game. I suppose you could have done. We could do that because we had the experience of the two years beforehand. Yeah. Um, but I suppose look, if you've seen the pictures of us on the field afterwards, um, just down on the knees, absolutely just ecstatic. <laughs> like you know, it was a lovely moment. We like, I suppose you never, you never get the chance that often to be kind of in such a commanding position that you can take Louise and her heart take off with three or four minutes to go, yeah. and she gets a standing ovation, and then. You look around and all your management team are on the sideline with you, everyone hugging and arms around each other, waiting for the final whistle to go. And then, I mean, it was just, it was, it was just a, a really, really emotional moment um, to look at the likes of Anna Maria O'Donoghue, who has been with us since that minor group, Cassandra Buckley, who was with our, our SNC and she's a selector with us the last six years, had a baby in March and came back to us. You know, Shun is only four or five months old and she was there with her headset on and came onto the field afterwards and then you look mm-hmm. at the newer newer um members of our management team the likes of pj reedy and, and mags Fitzgerald, who we brought in this year and they were just they had so much they had bought so much into it. they were so emotional even though they were only with us for a year they were so emotional about the whole thing um yeah it was it was brilliant you know it was brilliant i suppose people look have said have the, the two you lost was that did that is that yeah. why it made the third one so special and i suppose it, it was like you know we had fierce heartbreak especially last year yeah. against Dublin like we were probably favourites going into we were playing fantastic football I think we just peaked at the wrong time of the year because I suppose we we had to we was our first time back in division one for a long time and we trained really really hard throughout the, the winter to get right for division one and we won all our games won division one very very easily and then I suppose when it came to an Ireland final Dublin had done it all before and they peaked at the, the right time but very yeah. very like what we did this year you know and, and and as as um, I suppose uh, from the negative side of of that, as a manager, Declan and yourself, Dar Dar along with you, is it hard? Like how hard is it to you know get back up on the horse? You know, three times. Obviously, the third time was a success one, but after two previous defeats, and even to get the players buy in, and or was it? Was much work go into it? Um, I suppose after after losing the first one, you weren't too devastated. You were kind of going, "Geez, we we really we got there." We told the girls we would get them to an Ireland final. We told them we'd win the All Ireland final. Um, yeah, it was a massive promise at the time because Kerry Ladies Football was was really in the doldrums. It was in the gutter really, but that was the yeah. first thing we had to instill into them as a bit of belief. So it was easy to come back maybe the the second year after losing the first one and. But I suppose after losing to Dublin last year, where we got just got railroaded in the first 15, 20 minutes, Dara just turned to me at, in the middle of the field as Carlo Rowe was lifting the cup and we shook hands and he said, I'm done anyway. And I said, look, I'm done as well. He said, I said, I just, I can't go through this all again. And I suppose as, as a management team, we were togging out inside in the, a small room inside in Crow Park and uh, we looked around the room and Anna Maria said, I, I'm done as well, she said. And you know, that was the that was the moment that was the feeling that at the time that was it really like you know and how could we pick ourselves up again and i suppose look had a few drinks that night had a great night really after losing in all ireland and uh woke up the following morning and myself and dara we'd always room together no matter what and we started throwing a few ideas around going um geez if we move this girl here and 
maybe if we try this and maybe what did we learn from that yesterday? And he said, you know, there was a bit of a feeling there that we might go again. But look, we drowned in the sorrows for a while. We took a few weeks off. I didn't go to any of the club games for for a good while. And I didn't go to the intermediate and the senior finals, really. I didn't go to any of the club games before. I just yeah. couldn't stomach it, really. And I suppose then we kind of started ring, ringing around and we rang all the senior players first and to see what their appetite for it was. Like you start with Louise, player of the, player of the year at the time, I suppose. And then you go to Lorraine Scanlon and a Galvin. You know, you go to Cot Lynch and they're all going, geez, yeah, we want to give it one more year. If you'll stay, we'll stay. And we were going, geez, that's, 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 that's brilliant. Like, and how can we go now? So we planned a little bit differently. We brought in our new SNC coach, Eric McDonald, because like I said, Cassandra was having a baby, so she wasn't going to be able to do everything that she had done with us. Eric had been with us the previous year as well. So he owns a um, a gym in, in Killarney called Belief. So we used that an awful lot during the winter and all, all year, really. And I couldn't commend him enough. Like, you know, he was just a master of his art, like absolutely unbelievable. I don't really want to say his name because I'm afraid the Kerry Senior men or, or someone will come along and take him because that's the level that man is operating at. Like, you know, uh, he's a loud, he's a lot, he's from the County Loud originally. So we'd always be slagging about what they know, but you know, nothing about football up in Loud. We we'll do the football part, you just do the running and all that, you know, but um, he's great crack. Um, so it wasn't a really easy decision, but I, like, I did make it, I suppose the Kerry man rang and they said, uh, are you going back and all that? And I gave a kind of an exclusive to Paul Brennan and he printed the bloody thing in the back of the Kerry man. Quill says we're coming back to win in all Ireland, and I was like, "Ah, oh, Jesus!" So I took a photo of that, and I said, "No pressure, lads," <laughs> to the management team. And you know, we actually found the clipping the other day. It was just rooting through something, um, and I found the clipping, and I texted on the lads again. I said, "No, didn't I tell you?" <laughs> so it was nice, but um, it certainly wasn't an easy decision to come back again. But uh, by God, we're glad we did. You know, we got massive buy-in. We gave, I suppose, an extra month off to all the girls. We didn't start till December of last year. Uh, planned it a little bit differently. We got to a league final, and I would say that it wasn't on our radar at all. And don't think any of the girls really wanted to be in a league final either. We played terribly against Armagh in the final, and you could see that our interest wasn't really there. Our two big things for the year was to win Munster, something myself and Dara hadn't achieved, and to win the All-Ireland, something that Kerry hadn't achieved in 31 years. So um, to be able to say that we've done those two things and... Um, it was well worth coming back for for another year. How does um? And I was only looking at this today. Apparently, yourself and Dara in the ladies football, and Brian Dutton and Fergal Lohan. I know they've retired. I think you're the only two at inter county level, both male and female, that are joint management. H- how does that work? How how do you, who's the is there good cop bad cop or? Um, there can be, there can or be two but, bad cops. Uh, <laughs> like I suppose we both have things that we're very good at, you know. And and look, we're both we both played corner forward. Uh, we both were free takers. We're both married to Waterford women who actually grew up straight across the road from each other at Down in Waterford, which is <laughs> an unbelievable coincidence. <laughs> and so we're very, very similar. We have the same foot football philosophy in a way. We're both, like I said, both forwards, both lazy feckers. Didn't like to track back much or anything like that, you know, but <laughs> the old style corner forward, you know. Um, there's stuff that Dara is absolutely brilliant at. And, you know, I'd be slagging him that he works in the bank and he has all day to be answering the phone and being on to the county yeah. board and organising this, that and the other. And I'm a school teacher, so I can't touch my phone between nine and three. I'm off limits, you know, but... Um, we, I suppose over the years, I kind of developed that, you know, to take the jobs I would do and the jobs he would do. And, um, you know, I suppose there's a lot outside of just actually managing the team, you know, when it comes to LGFA, like, you know, you go over, you have to bring, you have to bring all your gear. There's no store there for you. You might, you might be in Brasna one night. You might be down in Kearns Rallies another night. You might be out in Kearns another night. You might be doing the college another night. So you have to carry all the gear around with you. Uh, you have to organize food. I mean, Cassandra brings the food from Killarney, the plaza, do the food for us. And then we have another lady who runs the golf club in Main Valley. Um, she does food there from the Harbour View. And she she did the food for the last two years off her own bat for us, you know. So you have to organise that. You have to wash the bibs. You have to bring the cones. You have to, you know. And then outside of that, you have to plan sessions. You have to make sure the girls are okay. You have to be in contact with the physio, the psychologist, every kind of a thing, you know. Whereas I suppose when... 
the likes of Jack O'Connor turn up to Kearns, they know where they're training. Everything is hung up for them nice and neatly. You know, yeah, yeah. Are you ready for them? Everything is ready to run the sessions. But look, there's a lot of it outside of that. So Dara takes a lot of that. I take a lot of it. And between the two, I don't think we could have done it without the two of us being, um, I suppose, yeah. sharing the amount of jobs. Partner football philosophy, we very rarely fell out, you know. Um, maybe once or twice over the five years we had we made ahead of a couple of words and maybe got a bit thick with each other about different things. But I think we were very much uh had the same football philosophy and I think it really, really worked. Um, you know, yeah. I suppose we have been very successful, so it has worked, you know. I suppose that's that's the way of looking yeah. at it. Too, right? <laughs> what makes a top class player for you? I suppose there look, there's there's different things, you know. The the commitment to the the whole the whole the game is is is, is a huge thing. Like, you know, if you take the likes of Kaylee Cronin or fullback, an yeah. an absolute monster of a footballer. We'd say, like, you see Dr. Crokes winning the club championship here in Kerry yesterday. Kaylee could have been on that Dr. Crokes team. She's so good, you know. Um, <laughs> she's a totally different type of player to what Anna Galvin would be in the middle of the field to us, to what she for O'Shea or Louise would be, let's say, in our forward line. But what 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 puts them at the top class is just their absolute commitment to what they're doing. Um, no stone to be left unturned by those girls, you know. Just And I'm just mentioning yeah. those three or four off the top. Um, you'll see players cutting corners, players not putting in enough into their recovery time or their preparation for training or games, and those girls will fall down eventually, or those men, whatever it might be, you mm -hmm. know. But a top class player will have everything pre training right, they'll have they'll train really, really hard, they'll never cut corners of training. Um, if you listen to Anna Galvin driving our training sessions, she's just phenomenal. Like she doesn't take, if you miss the line by an inch, she's on your back, like, you know, and then they're the first into the recovery, into the sea, getting the recovery and their food. Then they're ringing you talking about, well, I don't think this tactic is good enough for us. I think we should be doing something different. And you listen to them and they're just so committed and so involved. Um, I think without that, maybe 100% at inter-county level, definitely, I don't think you're going anywhere, really, you know. Um, you get the girls that are just coming into the panel and they won't be as comfortable of asking questions of a manager and things like that, or they might not understand the level of commitment that is needed, but, you know, the top-class players, the Louises of the world, the Kayleigh Cronins of the world, they're doing everything right all the time. Uh, and I suppose, without giving away too much secrets, uh, because they're obviously success secrets, what does uh, a, the Kerry ladies' training schedule look like, or what does a typical training session for Kerry look like? And that's, I suppose, for coaches that will be listening on this podcast, like a lot of, the, uh, I suppose, some people think when it's at an inter-county level, there's magicians brought in at some stages when, when teams are successful. And, and it just, it'd be great to hear, I suppose, how you approach your trainings. Yeah, um, like, I'm definitely not a magician. I've so much to learn about coaching i know still you know and i think that just like you said alan like people think people think that you just come in with a magic wand and you you wave it and you're going to be successful and you have to have this magic formula you don't really you just have to work really really hard at at it you have to pick maybe pick a philosophy of how you want to play and then you have to try and stick with that you but then you have to be very adaptable like you know we adapted our tactics i suppose from the Munster final this year into a quarter final into a semi final into the final we changed an awful lot of what we did so we didn't just stick to what we were used to all the time so you have to be very very adaptable but I suppose this year in our training sessions we brought in two extra coaches in PJ Reedy and, and Mags Fitzgerald uh, PJ is yeah. a GDA in the county and Mags would have played with Kerry herself so it gave the girls a fresh voice as well you know instead of just listening to myself and Dara all the time and it's something the girls wanted as well you know just different people talking at the training sessions so Look, you'd always have your warm up with your S and C crew. Um, we'd always get as many touches of the ball in. We'd we'd it'd be over to PJ and Mags to run a couple of drills and things like that. And it'd just be all about as many touches as we can. And then, you know, you depending on the time of the year, you'd probably go back to the S and C for a couple of hard runs. And Eric usually would have his his meters in mind of what he's what he was trying to hit for the week, and he'd give us his times that uh, he he needs for the night. And then, um. I suppose one thing I love about 
the intercounty season now is that it's it's week by week, you know, and I hate any time when there's a kind of a lull in the season, you know, those five or six weeks. I mean, what do you do for five or six weeks? It's just yeah. like I love when there's right, we're playing Mead in two weeks' time. So now we're going to tra- tailor our sessions to how Mead play and we're going to be ready for Mead and then we're going to concentrate on ourselves and how we want to play. And I love that. I hate three, four weeks before game between games because you're you're trying to fill sessions with just, you know, trying to really just fill sessions with stuff, you know, that is no real focus on. But like you know, you go playing in an All Ireland semi final against Armagh. Geez, they beat us in the league final. Right. What are we gonna do to upset Armagh to to make sure we get through that game? And like we played one of our cornerbacks as a centre half forward this year in the in the Armagh game. We we saw Lauren McConville as a huge threat to us. She was brilliant in the league final. And we put Kira Murphy, who's a brilliant man marker. She man marked the best players all year long for us. She'd be the Gucci's niece if you wanted a bit of pedigree there. And yeah. we put her as centre half forward. And we the girls bought into it. It was something we told them this is happening. The team just buy into everything we were doing, which is really amazing as well. Like there was no blowback. We'd always have conversations with the team and you know, they would throw things yeah. out to them. We'd get their opinion on it. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's me and Darius heads it around the block, I suppose. And, yeah. like, the, the job that Murph did on on Lauren McConville that day, you know, was was a huge factor in us getting over mm-hmm. the line. And then we changed attack again for the All-Ireland final playing Galway. It was just, we were just going all out attack. Like, you know, it was just first ball. We're just getting that ball into our full forward line. And from that moment, we were just going to kick the ball in as much as we can because we know the devastating forwards we have inside. So... It's very hard to say what does a carry lady session look like. There's lots of touches of the ball. There's lots of very focused stuff going on. You know, what we want our team to do. But then it'd be a lot of focus on the opposition as well. But we never, ever got bogged. We always found with the girls that if we got bogged down in the opposition, we'd play absolutely awful against them. Yeah. We did it maybe in our first our first championship game this year against Donegal. We really focused on Donegal. And we just, I think we melted the girls' heads a small bit. We overdid it on the Donegal stuff. We went up and drew nine all with them in a terrible game and a terrible day. But um, you just have to find out, I suppose, a formula that works for your team. And we found that a small bit of preparation on the opposition and a ma- massive focus on ourselves and what we want to do really worked for our team this year, especially. I, I, I had a great conversation, actually, with a guy the other day. And we were talking about, and this is a question I'm going to ask yourself, we were talking about game days and so on. And as a coach... And for, for me personally, on game days, especially when it's in championship fever, like I, I have my wife here and three kids at home, same as yourself, uh, did they're better off out of the house. I'm like a briar. Like, how are you come game day in the sideline or in the dressing room? What are you like or how's the... Um, <laughs> yeah, the week before, and like like you said, I could snap at any minute at home, you know, and I know it's been it's been tough on the wife and the kids at times and phone is hopping and you're trying to organize this that and the other and trying to make sure that you know you always have niggles in the dressing room and make sure this girl is going to be all right and is she going to train tonight and is she going to be okay and is louise's hamstring going to be okay and it's oh, you know there's a million things going on inside your head so you're like a briar around the place and you are snapping at people and i always we always i suppose try to bring in like darabee's high as a kite absolutely high as a kite and if we were meeting at 10 o'clock to go on the bus, Dara would be heading off at nine o'clock and he could be over waiting for the bus for 15 minutes. And he'd go, I'm going over now. I can't stay at home anymore. And whereas I'm kind of like a little bit more calm and saying, Dara, I'll meet you over at the bus. I'll be there a quarter to 10. Like, you know, we're not going till 10 o'clock, you know? Um, <laughs> so I suppose the, the, the guards pick up on the energy we have. We're very, very energetic um, around the dressing room, but never try to have, I suppose, my stomach being not at times before games and yeah. it's something I hate. Like, like before the Mead game this year, I just, I didn't want us to be knocked out in a quarter final. Like, I thought Mead were going to be very, very dangerous coming down to Tralee. Vicky Wall was back yeah. in the scene. Oh, my stomach was just in a knot. And I just, you know, a feeling. And then the all Ireland semi-final, nobody wants an all Ireland semi-final loss. You want to get back to Crow Park. You're one step away from it. Uh, you try to be just very calm on the outside, but inside you're being chewed up like you're just trying to get through a warm-up, trying to get through the bus journey, whatever it might be. But then when it comes to being on the line, I, like, and it's something I really learned from Jack O'Connor, I suppose, and I, I can't say I've always been very calm on the line because 
we'd be very, very energetic on the line myself and Dara. We'd be shouting in a lot of instructions. But yeah, I always try to say, look, we got to stand back here and there's there's got to be decisions got to be made to influence the team. You've got to stand back and see what's happening. Get out of the game, look at it and just see where we need to tweak things. And you you can't do that if you're up to high door the whole time on the line. I leave Dara up to that. He's up and down the field. He must do about 20,000 steps during the match because we we talked about putting him on a leash and things like that at times and getting one of those long dog dog leads for him, you know. <laughs> you look around and say, where is Dara gone? He could be up to the, down the corner flag, sits in something to the corner forward. Will you come down here? I'm trying to do something here. We're trying to make a switch. But um, uh, he's he's priceless, like, you know. But I wouldn't say I'm always calm on the line. Definitely not. You know, I've had my moments where I've affected the referees out of and things like that and been on the pitch and got got things that got the most, got the better of myself. But... If you're like that all the time, you're not going to make good decisions. So try to stand back, try to kind of look at things objectively and say, right, where are we going wrong? Right, we're losing a lot of our kickouts. We got to get instruction to go short, or we got to get instruction to start making our calls. We have different calls for kickouts. They're, they're not using certain calls that will work. Let's do that. Okay, we need to play a sweeper for a while because we're being overrun, or we need to kick the ball a bit more. And like if you if you're up to high dough all the time and roaring and shouting and, and not taking what's going on in the match, you're not going to be able to make those decisions, you know? Yeah. And I like to be kind of going into half time with two or three things in my head going, all right, we can win this game if we do X, Y, and Z. And we'd always talk it out with the players and we'd say, look, we need to do this a bit better. We need to do this a bit better and we do this. And if we do those three things, we'll win the game. And the girls would, would maybe make a suggestion or two and we'd take it all on board. And uh, it's really, really calm. Our dressing room has been very, very calm over the last few years. You know, and it's something that myself and Dara have learned that at halftime, the girls only barely listen to you anyway. You know, you don't be going in and shouting and yeah. roaring at them. It doesn't work anymore. So it, our dressing room is always really, really calm. It's a quiet place at halftime, really. And there's good decisions being made eight or nine times out of ten. And then you're listening for the feedback from the players because I suppose they're the ones out there in the middle of it. They're getting the feel for the game as they're playing it. We're only seeing it from the sideline. So we have to listen to the players at halftime as well, you know. Um, yeah. I, I think that's really, really important. But like, I suppose for managers and it, like I always taught Jack, I'll always remember Jack O'Connor and it was at halftime in, in the county championship game against South Kerry and we were being well beaten. I think we were eight or nine points down if I can remember back. I remember going into the dressing room and I go, we're in for it here now. He's going to absolutely roast us here. And Jack came in and he was the calmest man in the whole place. And I was like, and I think even a lot of the lads were looking around going, what? he's not fucking us out of it. Like, you know, Jesus Christ, what's this about? And he just said, lads, we're doing this, this and this wrong. If we do this, this and this right, we'll win the game. And we we, we came back from eight or nine points down. We drew the game. We won the replay. And it just opened my eyes to kind of going, right, that's, that's a different way of coaching a team. That's a different way of looking at a half time where, as you had coaches before, and they would have come in and effing and blinding and, Telling fellas everything no, is wrong, doing. but Jack just gave us pointers about how to actually fix what we were doing. We went out and put into pr practice, and you know we got through to a county championship final. It was it was a lovely kind of, and it's something I'll always remember. You know that just the different styles of management that that was his style, and I thought it just really resonated with me. That geez, if you're if you're not calm like that, you can't make rational decisions. Really, I, I suppose I, I I have three quick questions before we finish up, and I I just. What is your greatest achievement to date? I would say they all are, but there has to be something else, is there? Um, I suppose on player as a player, I suppose. Look, I have two All Ireland medals, but I, like I said, I was a sub for those, and I don't think they, they'll ever mean as much to me as the, the county championship medal I won in two thousand two. Uh, playing with our club, it was the first time in was it forty five years or something like that, or I can't remember the actual time now. It's gone out of my head, but. Like it was, uh, not I have yeah, about forty five years since we won the championship, and I'll never ever forget coming up Strand Street into our club, um, with the with the cup there and how much it meant to the, the community. Looking at my own parents, the the older lads around the club, how much it meant to them. Um, I think on the field of play that would be the greatest achievement. Um, outside of that, winning the All Ireland this year was just it was just such a relief. 
I suppose, yeah. number one to actually not be a manager to lose three All Irelands because that's your, something you'd want to be known as around three anyway. Um, but definitely, <laughs> look, as a manager winning an All Ireland, um, an All Ireland final in any grade, but winning a senior All Ireland, it's just an amazing yeah. feeling and mm-hmm. something no one can ever take away from you. And, you know, as, as some people text me after the game, how's the going, All Ireland winning manager? And I was like, Geez, that's nice, like, you know, <laughs> uh, and it's just a nice thing to have, you know, but um, to see, like, the likes of Louise uh, get in the medal, like, it was always something myself and Dara would always say, would we just love to put one medal into Louise's pocket for the 17 years she's played yeah. good times and bad times with Kerry. She's been so through so much, and I put Lorraine Scanlon just behind her, I think, 16 years. Wow. I said, like, to put medals into their pockets, since we took over yeah. and like we're already a small part of not don't, don't think I'm getting big headed about this now or I'm saying yeah. I'm the Messiah <laughs> myself and Dara we're the ones who did it but to be part of that journey with those girls that they have the medal the real big medal that they always wanted now and to say that we were part of that and we were part of getting Louise that medal it was it's it's something no one can ever take away from you know and it's something that I'll always look back at and smile and just say god that was fantastic like you know what what is your uh, I suppose what is your biggest regret or learning curve since you started coaching? Oh, I suppose, geez, and what's my biggest regret? I like I mentioned the lads uh, that I had with the minors, and I'll always regret this because I because I see it from a totally different point of view now. And I like I said about managers coming in and and eating fellas after games. There was one game we played against the Stacks in a, in a, and we were beaten maybe by a point or two. And actually, Wayne Quinlan was the manager of the Stacks at the time. He's now the Kerry Minor manager. And I went into the dressing room afterwards, and the keeper had made an awful mistake. He gave away a penalty, and I, and I went in and I ate him. And I just fuck it. I just. To this day, I'd be cringing about it, you know? And I did the same thing <laughs> to, to a lad earlier on in the year. For He came out, it was a bad day, but he came out wearing fucking tights, playing a match. And we got it wiped off the field. And I went in and said, I didn't see any of the fucking opposition wearing tights today, and you're our fucking captain, I said. And <laughs> he kind of had a word roared back at me, and I just said, I'm, a, I, I'm losing respect to these lads here for, for doing this. But it was, I suppose that was the way... We were kind of treated in the dressing room at the time, you know, yeah, going I know. To school, school, we had two real tough managers and we were winning the Kearney Verees and they would have effed and blinded in the coat. And but that's what we got in the dressing rooms. And I, I'd never, ever do that again inside in the dressing room. Um, it was something I kind of regret. It was a learning curve. Like I said, we changed totally in mindset, going in really calm, focusing on the positives. We're trying to fix the negatives that we've had, but... um. I suppose that it's not a huge, it's not a huge thing, maybe, but it was definitely a learning curve, and it would be a regret that I'd have to after for speaking to the lads that were doing their best yeah. for the club, seventeen years of age, and to speak to them like that, yeah, I, I, it wouldn't, it doesn't sit well with me, to be honest, you know. Yeah. Where would you like to see Declan Quill in five years' time? Will Jack O'Connor still be? Will Jack O'Connor still be the carry manager? <laughs> uh, no, um, I think look. There's a lot to be said. Uh, the intercounty game is is it's it's cutthroat. It's seven days a week. Um, I'd be good friends there with Derek McGrath through my brother-in-law, blowing Waterford, and I remember Derek training Waterford, and he took time out from his job um, as a secondary school teacher. You know, I think he took a year out because the workload was so much, and I could see it now from his point. I, I didn't really believe it at the time or realize maybe why he had done that, but seeing the workload that goes into um the lady side of it you know the men's side of it is more cutthroat again you know it's it's way more scrutinized in the media um it's it's you know you can see jack o'connor the what he you know i suppose after losing the semi-final he got torn to shreds this fella it's after winning everything possible with kerry like you know and an absolute messiah and kerry coming back three times to win all irelands and everything and you can see desi farrell when he wasn't going well with dublin he getting absolutely ripped in the media and things like that and he comes back and wins in all ireland so it's really cutthroat. So I don't know if I'd ever go down that road of getting involved in a men's intercounty mm-hmm. team, 
especially nowadays because look, I have three young kids. Um, we put five years of our lives into getting the Kerry ladies up to scratch and, and winning in all Ireland. And, you know, um, I'd imagine the workload in the men's side of it is, is just as much, if not more. And, um, I suppose in five years time, look, we have made no decision myself and Dara on the ladies, I suppose for the, for the year 2025, what we're going to do, um, yeah. if we're going to be involved or not, we'd have to sit down and chat because I was away on holidays myself and Dara was away then as well. So we haven't really met up since, um, I'm definitely going back. Like I'm, I'm training the under 11s in, in in the club here, and I love that. I love doing that. Um, I, my own, my old, my eldest lad is 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 at under 11. My middle lad is under seven, so I help out with them. And um, you know, I I think the club are it, it's going to be the next calling for me, no matter what. Um, yeah. I'd love just love to go back and give that 100 percent for a couple of years, and in, in five years' time, maybe be looking at you know being maybe part of a senior management in the club or being the senior manager or. You know, you just don't know what's going to be in 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 in, in store for you. Um, I don't think I'll ever be one of these guys that will will travel around club to club, um, charging per session or whatever they might be getting expenses <laughs> per session or whatever it might be. But I think I couldn't imagine myself going training another club. Um, I'd be, yeah. you know, I there's plenty of work to be done in our own club. You know, being underage and 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 up along and, um. You know, if the chance comes to to train a, an intercounty Kerry team again, you'd have to, it'd have to be looked at. You know, whether it be a minor team or an the twenty team or a senior going in somewhere along with the senior team, it'd have to be looked at because it's a it's a privilege. You'd, you'd surely have the growth. Pardon? You'd surely have the growth. You'd surely, like deep down, you'd have to have the growth if the phone was rang. It's like anything. It's it's my own county as well. If I got a phone call in the morning, I don't think I'd have a second thought. <laughs> yeah, it, I suppose. I suppose where my head is at now, I've I've been involved in five years and, you know, the energy levels might be a bit low and we've won in all Ireland, but, you know, where do you go from there? But, you know, if you took a year or two out and the phone rang in two years time and said, look, do you want to go into the backroom team of, of a Kerry senior team? You're like, oh, hang on a second. Oh, yeah, no bother. I mean, you know, mm. so you just don't know where your head is going to be at in a couple of years time, but um, definitely going to be involved in coaching do a good bit with my primary school here in Tralee, Gwail School of Agassman, and uh, we love doing that. We love going through the, the coming of months school with the boys and the girls and seeing the future stars, you know, train the likes of Dermot O'Connor, who's playing for midfield for Kerry, and the uh, likes of Dylan Casey playing full back for Kerry, and they went through the, the school above and played coming of months school, and it's great to see them going on playing with Kerry. Two of my own girls that, that played, Cart and Aoife Delan and, and Mary O'Connell played in the All-Ireland final this year. Two of them were sitting in my class a few years ago, you know, and Winning all Ireland with them, it's lovely. So I love love training the school teams because you get to train lads from all the different clubs around Tralee and the girls around that, and uh, definitely be involved in my own club in some in some capacity. So I'm vice chairman at the moment as well within the club, so that's another string to the bow. And <laughs> it, it, it's non-stop. I'm always going to be involved in something, like you know. My, my my final question for you, sir: What advice have you for any coaches starting off? Um, I suppose, and I think I got this from Derek McGrath. I can remember Derek giving a speech. I think it might have been in one of the GA conferences, and I think it's something myself and Dara would have really uh, put into to play over the last number of years. Is that and I always remember Derek saying that you look at the, the 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 players that you have, and you just see them as as humans first, and people first, and then players after that. And I think if you can do that as a coach. And not have these strict set of rules that everyone has to follow and like there's no way you can put let's say one of our players let's say called daniel o'leary daniel would come in the gate at 6 25 for a 6 30 session if she could get away with it she's a bit of a maverick she just would rock 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 in throw on her boots and come out in the field so that and she played brilliantly and louise she, would be she there done that to us a couple of years down in Tralee. yeah and louise would be there a quarter past five, getting physio, doing her foam rolling, her band work, she be out kicking. Uh, so how can you tell me you can have the same set of rules for those two totally different players? Like, you know, um, a player might come to you and say, look, I'd like to go for a few drinks uh, Saturday night. Um, I have this thing on. You know, if you're putting in a blanket drink ban across the board, you know, you might look at that girl or that fella and say, do you know what? You could do it going out with a few drinks on Saturday night. Off you go, by Enjoy it. And you might get a great return on that maybe over the next couple of weeks, you know. So I would say that you really, this this thing of putting in 
strict rules that everybody has to follow get away from that and start looking at the players and their circumstances and in a club team you might have a guy with three kids you might have a guy who's has to work late at night to make the extra few pound like how can you tell them that you have to be at every single session you're not playing in this team you know you have to look at them and say all right what's your circumstances yeah we'll work around that look we can work around just give me as much commitment as you can don't be telling me lies don't don't be telling me you're not you're turning up for training not turning up for training and you, i find out that you're out drinking or something like that or you're telling me you're working you know you got to look at them, them as people first and treat them like that and give have the crack with them and just enjoy it and then the players will follow and they'll give you massive commitment and massive um buy-in if you do that i think yeah i think also look, I, I think sorry ellen the other side of it, i suppose that's that's one side of it the other side is i would say be very flexible in your in your outlook like myself and dara we love playing attacking football we love kicking the ball and that's the way our team played but at times a lot of what a lot of people didn't see is that we would have played 10 or 12 behind the ball at times when we had to it would have gone totally against our philosophy but i would say like to any coach that just be flexible and if there's a time where you have to go against your own gut feeling or your own kind of philosophy or how you want to play the game then at time you just have to do it you know and you oh, be cringing at times going are we really going to put 13 behind the ball i don't want to do that but you have to look at it and say yeah do you know what we might have to do that here so just be flexible and enjoy it and, and and treat the players as people first that's what i would say anyway yeah Declan, listen we we'll leave it there uh i really really enjoyed having that conversation with you tonight and hopefully we'll see you on a sideline somewhere in 2025 just again folks um you're very you've been listening to the dss coaching series on the locker room podcast don't forget you can look at all the dss memberships information and everything else on www ddsportscience.com until next time we'll see you again and thanks very much Declan thanks Alec thank you very much